All right, here we go. Today we have Salvatore Gravano, a.k.a. Sammy the Bull, former mafia hitman and underboss. Welcome to Vlad TV. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Glad to finally get you here. We've been working on this for a while. Quite a while. Quite a while. I think maybe like two years. Right, right. Finally happened. Well, I had a lot of things going on, certain things I couldn't talk about, and I'm still a little bit in that situation, but we put it together. We'll we see put it happens. together. All right. It's our first time sitting down. I want to start in the very beginning. So you were born in 1945. Yes. And you grew up in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Yes. Uh, and both your parents are actually from Sicily. Yes. So what was Bensonhurst like in the, you know, the 50s and the 60s? A lot of Italian and Jewish people in the neighborhood. Uh, it was entrenched with mafia type of people. When my father came here, he jumped ship in Canada. He was an illegal alien. Um, families introduced him with my mother. They got married and they stayed in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. And I had two sisters and, uh, and then I was born. I actually had another two. A, a brother and a sister, but they died before I was even born. They died of pneumonia back then. That's what happened. And then the other two sisters were born, and they lived, and I was born later. Right. And uh, your dad, I guess, was a painter at first? At first, he was a painter. Right. And then I guess the paint started to make him sick? Back then, they used to use lead in the paint. He got lead poisoning, and he couldn't go near paint, and paint, lead was in all the paint. So my mother was a seamstress. Uh, she did some work for a Jewish contract in Manhattan. She was so good at it that he told her, they used to call her Katie, Katie, open up a factory in Brooklyn, and I'll give you all the work. If, I mean, if you put together quality work like this, and uh, she talked to my father, and she said, why don't you just quit painting? Come in with me and we'll open up a small little factory. I think everybody who was Italian who came from Italy, especially Sicily, was a seamstress. Hmm. So ants and all different kinds of people they knew, they put together a factory and they were in business. Right. And your real name is Salvatore, uh, which usually, you know, Sal would be short for that. But you actually look like your Uncle Sammy. Well... I resembled him a little bit, and they used to call me, uh, he was Big Sammy, they used to call me Little Sammy. Right. So uh, that's how I first got the name Sammy. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're going to school, but I guess later on you figured out you were dyslexic? Well, I, I, it would happen right away. I got left back in the fourth grade, mm -hmm. and uh, they found that I was dyslexic. But they really didn't know what it was back then or how to treat it or what to do with it. And school really wasn't for me anymore. And uh, in the seventh grade, I got left back again. And just before that, I joined the gang, the Rampers, and uh, I hardly went to school anymore. I was in a gang. Mm -hmm. So, well, Didn't you uh, break the principal's jaw or something like that? Well, one day we were out. We played hooky again. We didn't go to school. And uh, we got caught by truant officers. They took us into... Uh, the principal's office and he had people there and and uh, he was talking about us. We were sitting down and he used the term uh, these grease balls <laughs> and it's a slur, a racist slur, yeah. like you would use the N-word against blacks. It was the grease balls. It's our slur. And uh, it didn't bother me too much. I heard that a lot of times mentioned and uh, in explaining to them he said, this is how their parents are, and this is how they grow up. When I heard that, he was like attacking my parents. And the word greaseball again mentioned, it bothered me enough to get up and to tell him, it's got nothing to do with my parents, it's got to do with me. I'm playing hooky, I'm a fuck up, and not them, they're legitimate people working hard. And uh, he said the word again, told me to sit the fuck down, and I cracked him a shot, and I wound up breaking his jaw. You were how old? I'm not yet. I'm left back twice. I'm probably 15, 14, 15, something like that. Okay. So you get kicked out of school at that point. Yeah. And 
you're hanging out with the rampers, the local crew, and at one point, your bike gets stolen. Well, this is way before the rampers. I'm 10 years old, a younger kid, mm -hmm. and uh, my family was broke. Once a week, if we ate meat, it was like a big fucking holiday. Um, so my father bought me a brand new Schwinn bike, very expensive bike. Told me, you got to take care of this. We don't have a lot of money. You got to take care of it. And I took it out. Sure enough, I left it outside in a store and I went in the grocery store and I came out, it was gone. Hmm. A day or two or whatever it was later, my friends came running to me. Your bike is down the corner near the grocery store. And right across the street was a bar where all these made guys would hang out, almost like Goodfellas, shooting dice in the street, police car over there talking to them. And I came down and I grabbed the bike. There was two kids from around the corner, a little bit older, a year or two older. But a year or two when you're 10 is 12 year olds is a big deal. And I'm fighting them. I'm not going to give them the bike. They're trying to get it away from me. I'm fighting the two of them. One of these street guys walks over and stops it. And what's going on? And they told him it's my bike. I'm not giving this fucking thing up. These kids really couldn't explain it. And uh, he told the kids, he says, go get your fucking father if this is your bike. And they, as soon as they heard that, they took off. And one of the guys screamed across, what's going on over there? And my father's name was Jerry. This is Jerry's son. This is, uh, what's your name? Sammy. Sammy. He says, look at him. The way he was fighting, he's like a little bull. That fucking name stuck. I hated it when I was young because <laughs> my friends would make fun of me. And uh, later on in life, when cops were looking for me, they would look for Sammy the Bull. When newspapers came out, it was Sammy the Bull. It stuck like glue. I couldn't right. get rid of it. And, I mean, your father wasn't affiliated with the mafia at all, right? No, no. He knew somebody, his Gumbada. A Gumbada was like they came from the same town in Sicily, was supposedly, I found out later, a made guy in Sicily and a made guy in New York. And he was friendly with him. It was his Gumbada. They knew each other from Sicily and uh, Italy. And... Uh, but he was not affiliated at all. Okay. I mean, after those guys came in and got your bike back and everything else like that, did you start to kind of affiliate with the mafia guys or did that come later? No, that came way later when we were in gangs. Matter of fact, for us, when we were in a gang, it was, we didn't want it. We knew what mafia guys were. We knew they were dangerous. We wanted nothing to do with us. We were young guys. We all got tattoos. and we were It's us against the world. Fuck the mafia. Fuck the cops. Fuck everybody. All that type of attitude. So we really weren't affiliated. We knew who they were, what they were about, but we really didn't want to get involved. It became later on, um, if you want to hop, me to hop to that. Right no, no, no. Right? We'll, we'll get to that part. We'll get to that part. So- there was no mafia affiliation. It was just you and a group of kids running around right. causing problems, right. essentially. Okay. Well, then at one point, you joined the military. Yeah. This is that I don't join the military. I got arrested one time, and I went to court, and the lawyer came out with this thing that if it's a, they call it a wayward minor treatment. Um, if you give your word that you're going to join the military— uh, the judge will cut you loose. And I, I was about 17, bordering 18 years old. So I said I would do that. The case was dropped. I didn't join. And I didn't want to join. It was a scam with the lawyer and everything like that. But 19, my name must have been down through the court. 19, I got drafted. And I went into the military. I was drafted. When you joined, it was for three years. When you got drafted, it was only for two. And it was during the Vietnam War. So I went in. I was in tremendous, really good shape all my life, especially as a kid. So the military was good for me. I enjoyed the training. Everybody who came in from Boston or New York or whatever, wherever they came from, Harlem, Bensonhurst, wherever they came from, we kind of stuck together because there's people from all over the country. And I, I enjoy, actually enjoyed it. And I trained. That's where I learned how to kill. Okay. But you were stationed in South Carolina, right? In Fort yeah. Jackson? 
That's so, where I did basic training. Right. So you never went to Vietnam. You never had to no. shoot anyone or anything else like no, that no. during that time. But they train you. I went to Louisiana for jungle training and stuff like that. And they train you to kill. You're going to go into the war. When our whole unit came down to, on orders to go, I wasn't on it with a bunch of other guys. Now we went in. Why ain't we on it? What happened? And you had to have one year left of active service to be sent there because they ship you with ships. And I only had uh, eight months hmm. left. So they don't want to ship you. You stay there for a little while and they're shipping you back. They don't want to do it. You have to have at least a year. So me and whoever wasn't on those lists, we didn't have a year. We didn't go. That's why I didn't go. Got it. And then after two years, you got an honorable discharge and you went back to, to Brooklyn. Yes. Okay. So right back into the rampers. Right into it. Right. The only difference is the rampers started hooking up with street guys. Now, it wasn't us against the world. So, and this is where a friend of mine came to me, Tommy Spiro, and told me, my uncle Shorty Spiro wants to talk to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And who are the Spiros associated with? Spiros were with the Colombo family. Shorty Spiro and most of the Spiros were in a couple of mafia wars. And uh, they were legends in the neighborhood. They were big names. So I did meet with Shorty Spiro. And uh, he had told me, he said, Sam, you're a tough kid. You get into fights all the time. You're going to hit the wrong guy one day, and they're gonna get, you're going to get killed. He said, you don't have any backup, no protection, no nothing. You don't belong to nobody. He said, if you join us... We're a family. We'll have you back. You'll be part of a family. I'll never lie to you. I'll never double cross you. I'll never backstab. And sometimes when you're asked to do something, I knew what he was talking about. I may go with you. I do that myself. It was music to my ears. Family, a brotherhood, relationship like that. And I shook his hand. So I became an associate in the Colombo family. Okay, and was Carmine the Snake Persico the head of the family at that point? No. Carmine the Snake Persico was Shorty's boss. He was a captain. Uh -huh. And his crew was fighting the gallows in that war. So he was a very powerful captain. Later on, Joe Colombo became the boss of the family. Right. So now you're affiliated with the Mafia but you're not a made man at this point. You're just an associate, right? An associate, right? right. And during this time, you were doing larceny, hijacking, armed robbery, that type of thing? Absolutely. What were some of the, the most violent things you were doing during this time? I think when you do armed robberies and all that stuff, or hijacking, and those, these things are all pretty violent, but uh, I never killed anybody right. at that point. But I guess you were breaking arms and legs and... Well, yeah, fights, go there with a bat. One time, one time, come my person go call me down. And uh, this guy who owned a, a washing machine factory, commercial stuff, was banging somebody's wife. And uh, it upset come my person go, and he told me, he says, I'm going to give you a contract to go after. I want you to dig, give him a terrific beating. And I want you to take back his ear. I said, okay. I got in the car with Shorty and I said, but for real, bro? I mean, I'll give the guy a beat. We're going to want me to take his ear back? That's fucking crazy. He said, that's what he said. If you can get his fucking ear, take it back. We went to this factory, me and his nephew, Tommy Spiro. And um, we had a plan. We walked in. Tommy would talk to him about buying commercial dryers, and we were going to open up a store. And he pointed to a piece of paper where the guy would lean over to read what he's talking about. And I hit him with a blackjack across the head. He went down, a real big guy, and he started to get up. When he was getting up, he used the counter to put his hands on the counter. And I whacked his hands. I didn't want him to get up. And one of the fingers flew off. And uh, I jumped over. I started hitting him. But his workers were coming out from the back. 
One guy made it to the door. I backhanded him with the blackjack, hit him in the face, jumped back out. It was time to bail out. I was losing control of this thing. We got away. And uh, I looked for the finger for a split second or two. I couldn't find it. I was going to bring that back. Um, I saw Shorty, told him the story. And uh, we went down to report to Carroll Street to speak to Carmine Persico. And I started telling him the story, and he started laughing. He said, one of the guys on the inside, one of the workers, is one of my guys. I already know the story. He said, you try to find this figure? I said, it was, yes, but there was just too many of them coming out, and, and uh, I had to take off. He said, but I know you I, I know you knocked this finger off. I got this. Give me a hug. Give me a kiss. So I became, in his eyes, because he was very violent, a rising star. Okay. And Joe Colombo, who was the boss at the time, he liked you as well. Yeah. Uh, did he have you go and, like, picket FBI uh, headquarters? Yes. Okay, because he was doing the whole Italian-American Civil Rights League initiative. Yeah, yeah. Well, Shorty told me, he said, um, we have to go down and picket. We're going to picket the FBI building. And... Uh, it was for a guy named Sonny Franchise. He was the underboss at that point. He got arrested on some bullshit accounts that he's saying he wasn't guilty or whatever. And uh, and a few other issues. So we were going to go down. I think there was 12 guys the day we went down. Me, Shorty Spiro, his nephew Tommy Spiro, and about eight or nine other guys. I saw a blonde-headed woman. I think she had blonde hair, walking and a bunch of guys around her. And I remember asking Shorty, who's that? And he said, that's Sonny's wife. She's picketing with us. Um, there was FBI guys hanging out windows, taking pictures. And I remember telling Shorty, Shorty, we're committing suicide, bro. These guys are taking pictures of us. We're all going to go to prison here we're doing this. This is fucking nuts. I know, I know. Two days later, three days later, Shorty must have talked with Carmine, and they pulled us off. We, we didn't have to do it anymore. And uh, we walked away from that. But these things went on for a few years. The, it started to build up, and, uh, you know, there was more meetings and marches and all that bullshit. Yeah. And at this point, the books were still closed on Made Men. I guess the books had closed in 57? Yes, 55 or 57. Okay. One of those days. And at that point, did you really want to be a made man? I didn't even think about it. Didn't think it was it. closed for years and years and years. There was no mention of it being opened. So I didn't, it was the last thing I thought of. Okay. So then 1970 rolls around. And there was a guy named Joseph Colucci. Tell me about this whole situation. Joe Colucci was married to this girl, Camille. She was pretty hot. And she was having an affair with Shorty's nephew, Tom, my friend, Tommy Spiro. Joe Colucci put it together. He knew it, but he couldn't do anything because he was afraid of Shorty. He went to another guy in the crew named Frankie. And he told Frankie, I need your help. Frankie said, fine. Doing what? He says, I want to kill uh, Shorty and I want to kill Sammy. So Frankie said, you know, we all know about the affair. So he says, is this you talking about the thing with your wife? And yeah, but why would you want to kill Sammy? He's not banging your wife. And Shorty, he's the boss. Why would you do that? He said, if I kill Tommy, Shorty will put it together. And who is he going to send, bro? He's going to send Sammy. So if I kill the two of them now, I'll start some confusion. Six months later, I'll kill Tommy. That's his ultimate goal. He, he gets this whole plot together. Frankie don't buy it. And he goes directly to Shorty. And tells Shorty what he's being asked to do. Shorty goes to Carmine Persico. 
Carmine Persico goes to Joe Colombo. Joe Colombo gives an order to go back down to do the hit and have this kid Sammy do it. Shorty comes to me, tells me about it, and uh, he said, would you take this hit? And that comes in the life. When you come made, you can't refuse, but as an associate, you could, but you'll be washed out. And I agreed to do it. A a whole bunch of nights went by. We were working on it. I never did a hit before. And uh, one night we were out late, after hour clubs, drinking. Three, four in the morning, we left. We went to this cafeteria, famous cafeteria. Uh, They called it famous cafeteria. cafeteria. In... uh, Brooklyn on 86th Street. When he went down to the bathroom, I told the guys, Tommy, you get in to drive the car. Joe Colucci will sit in the front. I'll sit behind Joe Colucci and Frankie, you sit behind Tommy. We had it planned out perfectly. When he came up, we went out. We were doing just that. But instead, he opened up the the front. It was a two-door car. And he said, Sammy, don't sit behind me. Sit next to behind Tommy. And I did that. And Frankie sat behind him. We were driving down the block. And uh, there was a Beatles song playing. Tommy had it loud, like like he's trying to drown out something. I took uh, 38 out. I pulled the trigger and I hit him in the head. He didn't do anything. Didn't even move. I didn't know what the fuck happened. I hit him again. Now his body shook and slid to the side a little bit towards Tommy and sliding down a little bit. Tommy pushed him up a little bit. And uh, I said, go to Rockaway and we'll go dump the body over there out of our neighborhood and lower that fucking radio. And opened the window. You could smell the fucking powder in the in the air. We did that. When we got to Rockaway, there was nice homes with lawns. It wasn't like Brooklyn or it was more residential. I told Tommy, I said, open the door and kick him out. And Tommy's nervous and Sammy's dead. I knew he was panicking. I said, I know he's dead. Frankie opened up the window. He rolled the window down. It wasn't electric windows. He rolled them down. I jumped through the window. I got out. I opened up the door. I put one arm around his neck and one arm around his legs. He was a pretty big guy, but dead weight showed me how heavy it could be. It felt like he was a 1,000 pounds to me. I picked him up, put him on the grass in front of this house. Got in the car, my hand hit the seat and was covered with blood. And my hand slid across it. I closed the door. I opened the window. I put the gun out and I shot him three more times in the back. Just to make sure he was dead? Just to make sure he's dead. Well, you described the situation um, in other interviews. You said that you were actually excited by the whole situation. It was like an animal going after its prey. I said that later in what happened, when we were done, we got back. I saw movies that when somebody does a murder, that they're sweat, they're nervous, they're scared. And I expected that to happen. I thought that's what happens to you. So when we got back, we went into the apartment. The gun was gone. He was dumped. The car was being cleaned. I went in the shower. I was in the shower with the water running on my head down my back, and waiting for that to happen. I said it never happened. It never happened to me at all. When I went to bed, I slept like a baby. The next day when I got up, people were yelling in the house, in the apartment. They killed Joe Colucci. They found him in Rockaway. I remember asking a girl, did they know who did it? Did they get arrested? 
She said, I don't know. I don't think so. It's not in the paper. When we went on the corner, I felt an out-of-body experience that I was above the crowd watching and looking at them. And uh, I felt power. I felt power over life and death. I was an animal the night before with my prey. I didn't have any negative thoughts or feelings. And I thought, well, the movies are wrong. Or maybe this is just me. I don't know. And uh, that's what basically I had said. Those words, maybe not exactly the same, but that feeling. Well, uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Later on, you actually started to work with Joe Colucci's son years later, right? I didn't work with him. I had, I was in the, this is later on. I was out of the Colombo family. I was made a guy in the Gambino family. And uh, I was doing construction work. And the kid was doing concrete work, people's front of people's houses and things like that. And uh, I tried to take him under my wing and get him some work. He worked with my brother-in-law, Eddie, and uh, they, they knew the story. So I said, help, let's help this kid. So we, I, we did help him. And uh, I stayed friends with Camille, his wife. I never went with her, but we were friends. And I helped her in a few situations as well. She never knew I'm, I was the shooter. I, she never knew I killed him. She never knew who did what. Either the kid Jack at that, at that point. Yeah. Well, now you just did a hit for the mafia. And uh, Persico really, really liked that you did that. Yeah. So now you're kind of getting, you're moving up the ranks. You're still an associate, but now you're... Let you're, me give you a little example about moving up the ranks and how they felt towards it. When I would be down Carroll Street with Shorty, Shorty would say, I'm going to stop on 86th Street. I got to see Joe Colombo, who's the boss of the family. So he would, I would be driving. I'm like his driver. I'm driving it. I would park a little bit up. He'd walk back and walk over and talk to Col Colombo. I'd get out of a car, stand by the car, 100 feet away, 80 feet away, 70 feet away. I'd never go over there. It's not my place. And I would just stand there. I'm an associate. I'm nobody. After the hit, maybe a week after the hit, I don't even know the exact time, to tell you the truth. We were going to do that message thing again. I parked. He got out of the car. I stood where I was supposed to stand. And Joe Colombo yelled, Sammy, come here. Get the fuck over here. And I walked over. And he said, you don't like me? I said, no, Joe, I don't know who's telling you that. I think the world of you. I really do. I, I, I think the world of you. I mean, I don't know. Who would say something like that? He said, listen, from here on out, when you come, and Shorty, don't stand by the car. Come with Shorty. Stand right here. Don't open your mouth when people are talking. I don't need your opinions. Just stand here. Shake my hand and stand here. So it changed. Now, going to a club, we were kids. We were always in fucking fights. They didn't want us in these clubs. So I went to a club one night with my friends. We were in the back of the line. A bouncer comes out. He looks at us. And uh, I said, uh oh, he's going to go in and get the boss. And they're going to probably tell us you can't come in. Sure enough, the boss came out with him. And he came over. And he came right to me. And he said, hey, Sammy, he shook my hand. I don't stand on the line. Come on in. I got a spot in the VIP room for you. You what? For me? You sure? <laughs> I don't even know what he was talking about. So we're walking in the club, and one of the guys, Lenny, tells me, he says, Sammy, what the fuck happened? Would you kill somebody? I said, no, I didn't kill nobody. I says, I don't know what the fuck, uh, what this is about. But rumor had it, it wasn't so much that they know I killed somebody. It was that now I'm standing with a boss, cars would pass 86th Street. Holy shit, you see Sammy standing there or shaking hands with the boss? Because I'm not, I'm not on that level. I'm not a main guy. I'm not one of them yet. But that's where I'm a rising star, and, and they're thinking about making me. And that's where I have problems with Shorty's brother, Ralph. Okay. And then, you know, before we get to that, in 71, you actually got married uh, to 
Deborah Skibeta? Yes. You had two children. Yes. And if we fast forward, your daughter, uh, Karen, ends up being in uh, Mob, Mob Wives on VH1 yeah. in 2011. That was a lot of years later. And then, you know, in 2013, she actually released a book called Mob Daughter, The Mafia, Sammy the Bull, Gravano, and Me. Okay. So that whole situation happens. And then there was a situation with Ralph Sparrow, who was uh, Shorty's brother. I guess he became somewhat envious of some of your success. He was jealous and envious. And I rem I remember guys telling me he had a an argument with Shorty, his brother, he's saying, why the fuck you keep taking Sammy down to Carroll Street to meet Junior when I want to get my son made when the books open up? Why are you doing that? And he says, I don't do that. I don't. He says he's asking for him specifically. And I put him in the car and I take him down there with me. So anyway, Ralph was very frustrated with this whole situation, but he didn't know how to undermine me. I didn't really stay with him. Um... Uh, we had a guy in our crew, Ralphie Ronga, real tough guy, got out of prison, great guy, really a good guy. Matter of fact, we had a case going, we had a problem, he robbed somebody at a bank, you know the bag, they used to have a bag, the zipper on the top, he robbed it, he never even took the lock off and looked at it, he threw it on the table, he said, see if this is enough money to pay for the lawyers. So I said, Ralph, there could be 20, 30, you know, back then, 20, 30 was a lot of money. There could be 20, 30,000 in there. He said, use the money. Whatever's left from the lawyers, give, give it to me. It's a great guy. He goes on a robbery himself, and he gets in a shootout with cops, and he's killed in the street. And uh, two weeks after that, I'm in a bar in Shipset Bay with uh, Johnny Rizzo Sr., made guy in the Gambino family, Louis Melito is in the Gambino family. My Goombada Ali boys in the Genovese family. And a cub, my Mikey Mozzarella and a few guys. And I know them all. And we're all a dinky little shithole. And we're all together talking, having a drink. And this uh, woman comes in, blonde, teased hair, short, mini dress. Real sh It wasn't that many back then, but this one was super short, high heels, with some guy, muscle guy. And, and Rizzo says, Sammy, that girl's checking you out. Now, we always break balls amongst ourselves. So I says, come on, John, just with a guy. You're going to start with that shit? <laughs> I might go over. We'll wind up with a fight with the guy. Come on, leave him alone. Leave it alone. But she was looking at me. Now, when the guy went to the bedroom, she got up and started moving towards us. And Louie Molito said, Sammy, I don't think the old man's bullshitting. She's coming straight for you. You don't know this, bro? No, I don't. And then Rizzo hit me, go over and talk to her. Then I went over to talk to her. When I got from the distance from me to you, maybe even a little closer, I, it was Ralphie Ronga's wife. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't believe it. So I told her, I said, what the fuck you doing here, bro? Your husband just died. She said, Sammy, life goes on. Yeah, life goes on my fucking ass. He's not even cold yet. Give it a chance. <laughs> the guy was just coming out of the bathroom and she said, you know, Sam, I remember how you look at me. I could get rid of him. Me? I was a fucking douchebag. I never looked at you in no fucking way. I loved your fucking husband. You, you fucking man. I, w I was on fire. The guy started coming over. He, he says, what's going on? As soon as he got over, everybody stood up. Four or five guys stood up. Nice, quiet. So I said, listen, bro, get the fuck out of here with this douchebag. Get out. Listen to me. Why you can't get the fuck out with her? It's got nothing to do with you. Get him and get the fuck out of here. When she went back to Ralph, she said that I abused her and all this bullshit. Ralphie Spiro called up my wife and said, Sammy tried to make Ralphie's ex-wife, his wife. And uh, Carmine Persico knows about it. Sammy's going to get killed. And he blows this whole thing up to create a story that's not true. He doesn't know all them guys are there. So 
When I go home, my wife tells me the story. I said, this life is very technical. Make sure you tell me every word, exactly what he said. That Carmine's going to kill you and you try to make uh, Ralphie Ranga's wife. I said, I didn't try to make her. She's a fucking rag. I chased her. But you sure that's what he said? Yeah. And I went in my room. I got a gun. I got my car. I went right to fucking Ralph's house. And I got out of the car. I put the gun behind me by my ass. And I, now we were like good fellows in and out of each other's houses. I, I rang the bell. His wife, Ann, came. I said, Ann, where's Ralph? I need to talk to him. Something important. As soon as he was going to come to the door, I was going to shoot him. So she said, Sammy, I don't know. Something happened. He left. He didn't come back. Is there a problem? No, 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 Ann. There's no problem. And I turned to walk away. She saw the gun. And she told Ralph. Uh, Shorty, Sammy came here with a gun looking for Ralph. This whole thing exploded into that what I was going to do. Now, they were going to hurt me. But when Carmine, who was in jail, his brother, Ali Boy Persico Sr., was running the family. And he said, Ralph told your wife that my brother, Carmine Persico, was going to kill you? He turned around to Shorty. He said, you know what? If Sammy got killed, his wife would have thought my brother did it. I'm almost fucking sick that he didn't get your brother and kill him. He deserves to die for what he did. And he lied because there's other people coming in, witnesses that were there. He didn't try to make this guy's wife. He used the shit out of her and chased her. But being it was Shorty's brother... They held on killing him. But they knew we could never be together again. Johnny Rizzo Sr. had gone up the ranks in the Gambino family, talking about me, talking about the whole situation. Seems like Carlo Gambino got involved and two families talked. How they resolved it was, I would give my word I would never hurt Ralph. And they would transfer me with no restrictions over to the Gambino family. And I would be under this guy named Tato Arello, who was a very powerful captain. I actually grew up with his son. I never met the old man, but I knew his son, Charlie Boy, for years and years and years. So that's where I was going to stay. And Tato, the day we went down and I, this meeting happened, and I was formally put over with them on the way home, he says, I want you by my club every day. If you got a job, quit. He says, I want you to every fucking day. I'm going to know everything you do when you're going to get laid, if you get a pimple, anything you're going to do. You get into a fight, an argument, everything you do, I want to know. You embarrass us once. There was a lot of people talking for you. We'll kill you immediately. But I want you at my club every single day. And he was going to school me for the old man. Carlo Gambino and I would become a Gambino and I would learn their way. Their way was different. Colombo, beat him up, bring him back in the ear, shoot him, beat this guy up, fuck that guy up, rob this guy. They were business, unions, all kinds of things. Tano out of his mouth in some of the meetings we had personally said, violence, we can use violence but always as a last fucking resort. We listen to the stories, we make up our mind, and we don't react to one side. Those two little things on the side of your fucking ears, is God gave you those two ears to listen to both sides of the story. Then you make up your mind. So, I think you owe me a few dollars more for this story. <laughs> So now you're with the Gambinos. Yeah. Okay. So you're rolling with the Gambinos. And then there was a situation where someone claimed that you were responsible for a double murder in 1969. Yeah. It was a false accusation. Yeah. But but here you are. You get actually indicted for, the mur for a double murder. Right. And you didn't have enough money for lawyers. No. So you went on a spree, a robbing rampage? A spree. We robbed anything and everything that wasn't nailed down. 
um, it was constant. Matter of fact, I was out on bail, $100,000 bail. We had each, each guy in the murder. Um, I got arrested two more times out on bail. Hmm. For what? One time we was robbing, and we call it uh, trunking. We'd go into trunks and we would rob everything. New cars, take the spare tire. If we found golf clubs, we had it out for golf clubs or bowling balls or anything you had in there. We found people who stashed money in there, people who had drugs in there. No matter what we found in there, we took. One day when we were doing that in Manhattan, in a really wealthy area, there were so many cars hit in, because there was other crews doing things like that. Um, some guys come running down the block, and I yell to my Goombada Ali boy, jump in, hurry up. He jumps in the car. The guy was right on my bumper. He didn't have a uniform, but he had a gun out. So I ducked down on the seat and hit the fucking gas. But by the time I came up, I hit a string of parked cars. I must have blasted six, seven, eight parked cars. I didn't break my nose. I shattered my nose. I almost went through the steering wheel. Those, I, I know now you can't even break those fucking things. Um, I hit it that hard. I was in the hospital. I came out. And uh, we're on bail for another case. So I told my Goomba, we got to just keep going. Now, now, now there's lawyer, more lawyers, more bail bonds. And uh, we're in the car. We're going to go out. He said, Goomba, let's take tonight off. I said, we can't, bro. We, we need this fucking money. We have to. He said, look at your T-shirt, bro. The thing is all bandaged. My most, It's leaking now. Shirt is full of fucking blood. If a cop passes, he's going to see that blood. He says, Sam, Sam, you got too much ball. Stop, bro. Let's stop. Let's take the night off. Hearing that from him, he was the ballsiest guy, my Gumbada. But I stopped. A month or two or three later, we hit on a snowy night Sears tire store. We took a hundred and something tires, rims, everything at night and we had a garage a four-car garage from the tires we would steal hitting cars plus this it looked like we had a hundred and something almost 200 tires and we got busted in that drop okay and that was another case another bail right but going through this whole spree uh your boss uh tato uh Aurelio was actually impressed. And is that when he started thinking about actually making you a made man when the books opened? I don't know what point he started to think that. I was I was so close to him, it was crazy. I mean, he was like a father to me. He was the same height built as my father, and I loved him as much as I loved my father. And uh, I don't know when he thought that. I know when... He sympathized. I could tell when we were out stealing and getting busted and still getting in trouble, it was like we were going down the tubes. And he was trying everything. to told people, buy tires for your cars. Well, I don't need them. Buy fucking tires off him. He was fucking demanding people, to, trying to help us in every way he could help us. And uh, so, but came a time when I beat the cases and I was done with everything. And uh, one of the Colombo guys see me, this guy, uh, Sally Abanese, in a bar. He came over, he hugged me. He said, Sammy, I miss you. How you been with that guy? That guy, Tuttle's a good guy. I said, great guy, I love him. He had his arm around me. He said, Sammy, tell me the truth, bro. You were going to shoot Ralph, Ralph right in front of his wife in the house, bro. <laughs> if he came to the door, I was so fucking mad, bro. I would have did something stupid like that. I think I would have, you know. But uh, he says, listen, tato has got uh, uh, something nice he's going to do for you. What? Nah, I can't tell you. But I'm telling you, if he ever tells you, wear a suit, a white shirt, and a tie, I got a meeting, you're going to come with me, you're going to enjoy that meeting. 
he knew, because they pants your name around, he knew that Tyler was going to make me. He didn't tell me, but he said it in that form. And I kind of realized, and the same night I went to go get made, Charlie Boy, her son, was dressed in a suit, a white shirt and a tie, and we were going together. So we got made the same exact time, same day. That was 1976. Yeah. So now you're a made man in the Gambino uh, crime family. What changed now that you're a made man, as opposed to, to an associate at that point? Well, the whole, the whole, I mean, it takes time for people to realize it. You're not, you're not telling nobody, but the whole world seems that the, your whole power structure changes. Now you're a made member in the mafia. Everybody in every family is your brother, not just your own family by Gozanostra's laws. So you you become a fucking powerhouse. Just the mere fact that you're a made guy. People know you're going to get in a fight. You hit a made guy, you're going to get killed. There'll be fucking 40 guys who look to kill you. So it, it's the power structure. People know about it. It becomes huge. And then it opens up business things and unions like he's been teaching me. That, you know, as I already had a plumbing company, I was opening up a drywall company. Now, unions, I was getting stronger with unions. Not only for myself, but for Joe Blow. Let's say you ran a union and you're another May guy. I would tell you, bro, I need some help in this area. Yeah, Sammy, I'll take care of it. What do you want me to do? Your power is growing by the fucking day, by the minute. And People not being told, but seeing that, seeing very powerful guys now coming over to you, grabbing you with both hands, kissing you on the cheek. Wow, they never did that to Sammy. What is this, something new? No, you want to know? I bet you they made this guy. And then rumor comes out, you're a made guy, especially cops. Everything changes, you know. So it's right. a big deal. And I guess right around this time is when you met John Gotti? Yeah, I met I met him in uh, late '76. I was in uh, Frank and Chico. It was a made guy, a real tough guy. His father Boozy was a made guy. Frankie had a club, a gambling club. I would go there to, you know, always promote and help him with be there. And uh, Boozy was me and him were drinking at the bar. They were gambling in the back of crap table. And he said uh, John Gotti came in with an entourage of four, five guys, six guys. He says, you know this kid, Johnny Gotti? I said, no. I heard of him. He actually helped a friend of mine in prison. But uh, I heard of him. That's him? Yeah. And he came in, and then he came over to me and Boozy. We bought him a drink. I said, I hear a lot of nice things. You helped a friend of mine in prison. Um, something with the black guys. They were dealing drugs. And he stiffed him or something. The black guys were going to go to work on this guy pretty good. And John stuck his two cents in, straightened it out, gave them the money, helped this guy out. And uh, so I said, I appreciate you did that. You know, you didn't have to. As soon as, as, soon as I heard your name, he says, I, I talked to them. He says, they were good guys. It really wasn't your friend. It was your friend's friend. <laughs> and he got sucked into, he stood up a little bit, and these guys would have hurt him for sure. So... I, I thanked him for that, and then he said the uh, same thing to me. I hear some really, really good things about you, Sammy. I says, well, I think you're going to have the same uh, situation, stuff like that. So that was how, and he didn't get made, I think it was until, that was late, uh, 76. He didn't get made till 77. Right. Okay. So now you're a made guy in the Gambino uh, family, and- like you said earlier, the Gambinos really liked businesses and, you know, construction, trucking, garbage, and everything else like that. Is this when you started getting heavy into the whole construction business and so forth? Like I said, I was always in construction. I had smaller business. My businesses were growing. My power was growing within unions and stuff like that. And yes, my businesses grew tremendously. Uh, my drywall company... I had 200 carpenters working for us at one point. It wasn't me alone. It was this guy, Joey Madonia, was 
uh, really a good guy. He ran the company, owned the company, but I became his partner. We had 200 employees, not employees, carpenters. There was other people, office workers and everything else. We're not even counting them. So my companies were growing like crazy. Right. And you became a multimillionaire around this time. Yes. Right. You got a, you built a big uh, estate in uh, Ocean County, New Jersey. You bought horses. <laughs> um, and you also bought a disco called the Plaza Suite. Yes. And that was sort of your headquarters in a way? Well, my, my, it was a, it was a pretty big building. Um, it was about 5,000 square feet on each floor. So downstairs I had my office and a carpet place. The place was the carpet place was the corner one and everything else was my office. Uh, and then upstairs was the plaza suite. It was a disco. So it was 5,000 square foot disco. Okay. So then in 1980, uh, a war broke out in Philadelphia. Yeah. Uh, the Philly boss, uh, Angelo Bruno, got killed along with the uh, consigliere uh, Antonio Caponegro uh, without getting permission from the commission. So I guess with the commission, in order to kill a boss, they have to sign off on it. And that didn't happen. Is that accurate? It's always accurate. Not always to kill a boss. You can't kill a boss. That's one of the golden rules. The only way is that if the commission gives you a hit, uh, the, the hit. Um, they did that without Albert Anastasia years ago. It it it, uh, it just don't happen. Uh, and uh, so th it doesn't happen because a boss no matter how shitty he is, the other bosses don't want to say, okay, then kill him, because that puts them in the same position. Mm. Somebody could come up with the same argument about them. So they want to make that rule as ironclad as possible. Okay. And, uh, well, his consigliere, uh, Antonio Caponegro, was the one who actually did the murder. The commission summoned him to talk to him about it, and he got sentenced to death for doing it, and I guess he was tortured and killed at that point. Yeah. Philip Testa became uh, the new boss in Philly with uh, Nicky Scarfo as his uh, consigliere. So then the commission uh, placed a hit on all of uh, Caponegro's co-conspirators, including a guy named uh, Johnny Keys, a.k.a. John Simone who happened to be uh, the cousin of Bruno. And the Simone contract was given to you. There's a whole series of events that happened leading up to that point. Angelo Bruno was killed. Tony Bananas, I call him, Sagrada, Nino, whatever his name was. And his brother-in-law, Joe Salerno, was killed. Phil Testa was killed. Um, believed by uh, Johnny Keys. Nicky Scalfo wind up there and he was left. The commission was back in him against Keys and then they couldn't kill him. The whole five families and the family in Philadelphia couldn't kill him. And there's guys in our family bunked into him, had a meeting with him, it went to the commission. The commission said, well, if your people can meet with him, then you have the contract, get it done. So again, another original thing that a commission gives a hit to another boss to do a certain hit. And I got that hit. I was given that hit. Right. And I remember, I think, uh, in an interview with Michael Franzese, we talked about how, you know, in, in certain other gangs, like, you know, the Crips or the Bloods, a lot of times when you get a hit, there's usually money associated with it. Okay, 20000 30000 and so forth. But in the Mafia, you don't get paid to do hits. No. It's a respect thing. There, it's not respect. It's part of the, you know, your job in protecting goes in Austria. has nothing to do with money. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, then you're not 
doing if we're going to go to Russia, you're doing it for money. So, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, just about a golden rule in the mob. It's not about money. Right. So you get this uh, contract uh, to kill uh, Johnny Keys. So you actually get to know him first, right? I have. I don't. I don't really get to know him. I, I have a couple of meetings with him, and I'm not friends with him or anything like that. But I get to meet him a couple of times. The only reason I'm meeting with him is I'm going to kill him, right? And I'm trying to know what he is. He's not like uh, in the street where you could just kill somebody. He's in a war. He's got 20, 30 guys around him. They're at war. They're not looking to fight. They're looking to kill. So I just want to meet him to know who I'm, who I'm hunting. We're going to be, when we meet, two samurais. I'm young and uh, up and coming. I'm a hit guy. He's much older. I'm told he's got 50 hits under his belt. He's smart. He's cunning. He's dangerous. And uh, if he smells something wrong, he will fucking kill you in a split second. But first, they'll torture the shit out of you to find out what you really know. I was advised not to go to the meeting. I said, I need to, I need to know who I'm fighting. I need to look at him in the eyes. I need to... Be with him. I was, how the fuck am I going to kill him? He's got 30, 40 guys. I don't even know who, what the fuck he's about. And I had meetings with him. So when you're saying, I'm, I, you know, I didn't make friends with him, but I had meetings with him mm-hmm. twice. The third meeting we had, he died. Right. I guess uh, you had two guys with you, uh, Melito and D'Angelo? Yeah, I had more than that. But okay. I had a few others. A few guys. Yeah. And uh, you guys were at the Yardley Golf Club in Pennsylvania? If that's the name. I don't remember the name. Right. So you essentially kidnapped him? Basically, yeah. Snatched him. Snatched him up. You took him out to this wooded area in Staten Island. And uh, before he was killed, he actually had some requests. Yeah. And what were they? If I didn't, if I wasn't the guy to pull the trigger, he wanted another, a made man to kill him. And I'll give you something that maybe is not expected. He knew he was a samurai. And he knew he lost the battle. And he was going to die with honor. That's what he wanted. Mm Mm-hmm. The other thing he wanted, he wanted a few things. So he wanted a made guy to be able to shoot him. He wanted to die, goes in Austria style. He wanted me to take off his shoes. And I asked him why. And he said, my wife isn't stupid. She knows I'm in the mafia. She knows there's a war going on. I would tell her, calm down. I'm going to die without my shoes on. So don't worry about this, meaning that he's in the street, he gets killed, his shoes are still on. So he's trying to calm her down and tell her that. And now what he's doing is sending his wife a message hours, minutes, before he's going to die that if his shoes ain't on, She'll know that I was thinking of her in my last minutes. It blew my mind. This wasn't a regular story no more. This wasn't a hit story. It's not a gangster fucking movie. This is a fucking love story here. Mm. I had so much respect for him that it's insane. Yeah. He showed me a few things in the time period that we were together, showed me the real side of Gozenosha. He showed me how to die. 
like a man. Yeah. I've questioned myself my whole life after that. Could I die like that? Like he died? Blew me away. I'm going to say another thing that's going to maybe blow some people away. In that 12 hours I was with him, I fell in love with him. The respect I had for him was off the charts. I wasn't happy about killing him. I felt dirty. I felt I killed the epitome of our life, which was supposed to be. He was that. Yeah. So let's get further into it before I start getting a little fucking, uh, little disturbed. Every time I tell this story and think about him and see his face, it bothers me. Yeah. So. Well, uh, by the early 80s, uh, the Plaza Suite uh, discotheque was was doing great. Um, you know, you were having lots of live acts like Chevy Checker and the Four Tops uh, performed there. And a guy named Frank Fiala, who was uh, a wealthy businessman and also a drug trafficker, uh, first he offered you 40 grand to rent the Plaza uh, for a birthday party, right? Who did you talk to? How do you know this information? A lot of research. <laughs> You got some good information in it. Yep. All right. Um, but then, I guess a couple of days later, he approached you and said he wanted to buy the club from you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a little story in there, but yeah. Okay. And I guess uh, he offered you a million dollars? Yes. And the club wasn't even worth that much. It was worth like 200000 I guess, in your eyes. The club was worth about two hundred thousand. The whole building it may be worth five. Yeah. And he wanted to buy the whole building, club and all. Aha. Uh -huh. For a million dollars. Okay, got it. And uh so he put put a deal together with you. It was a hundred thousand dollars cash, uh six hundred and fifty thousand in gold bullion, which is gonna be paid under the table to avoid the taxes on it, and then two hundred and fifty thousand at the end of the closing. Right? Yeah. But after, you know, the deal was made and before the tra transaction was actually completed, some problems started to arise. Yeah. Explain. There's so many problems. He wanted to throw himself a party in the plaza suite. And uh, we let it happen. He was going to invite 300 people. He was going to shave his head in the middle of the party. Um, everybody was going to get coke and all kinds of going to have a raffle with boats and motorcycles, all kinds of weird shit. I was against it, but everybody was in on it. So we let it happen. I had my guys in there who were bouncers, my regular guys, and I brought more guys in because I was afraid that this, was, this guy was a complete lunatic. And uh, more or less true tonight, it, it was true. First of all, it wasn't 300 guys, maybe 100 people. And uh, everything that, I mean, he brought in Chinese food, tons of it, with no utensils. People eating Chinese food with their hands. <laughs> His, so I said, they're, they're all crazy. And we, we went through the night without any major troubles. And then I said, let's close it down. Let's end it. He was going to give us a check. I didn't think it, I, didn't, I figured the check wouldn't go, go through. So anyway, I called him over. Well, Michael DeBat went and talked to him about it. And he said he wasn't going to close it. So Michael DeBat came back to me. Then I wanted to talk to him. And I talked to him. I was sitting with four, five, six of my people. And I said, bro. It's over. The party is over. I went good. All your friends, some of them are leaving now. We're not down to too, too much. We got to go. We got to close it up and this, that, and the other thing. He didn't want to go. Then he got insulted. And he went to a, an attache case. And uh, he came over and he had a medal, a military medal. And he says, who the fuck do you think you are? And he threw this fucking medal at me. My guys went to get up. I said, sit down, sit down. And it bounced off my chest. 
And uh, that's when he came back the day or two after that and asked for to buy the, buy everything. He wanted to buy me out and throw me out. Now, Michael DeBat, the same time that thing happened, went, went into his box and he had a gun. He took the gun. So I had asked Michael to check his stuff. He says, I already did. He had a gun. I got it under my belt. You want it? No, no, I don't want it. Just hold it. So he did so many crazy things. It would take an hour and a half just to say the things he did. And he was controlling this little, I believe they were Czechoslovakian or something like that, gang, drug dealers. And he had a business where if a ship got in trouble, he would send planes over with parts and stuff to fix the ship at sea. Hmm. So it was a perfect vehicle for him to take drugs. And he was in the drug business. So he kind of three quarters of the way through the deal, the, the, things, the, the things that were happening were worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And, worse. and uh, finally, I got a call it was my sister. She was working for me. She said, he just came in with a bunch of people and dogs. They're breaking walls. They told us all to get out. That if he owns the building and he wants us all out. He's in there now, breaking walls. Yeah, I still own the joint. I said, listen, get all the girls and get out. Go home. Tell everybody, close it up. Don't get in the middle of this. Close it up. So I went there with my brother-in-law. And uh, he was there. And as soon as I walked in, there was guys breaking holes in walls. I never seen anything like it. So he's, he says, come with me to my office. And he's walking. He's going to my office. He's taking me to his office. It's my actually my office. We walk in. My brother-in-law is dark-skinned, Sicilian. And I'll tell you why I'm saying that. This guy goes behind my desk, opens up the drawer, and he takes out an Israeli, a Jewish uh, machine gun. And he turns around and he points at us. My whole fucking chest tightened up. I think any second I'm going to get blown away. My brother-in-law, the dark skin, turned white. He's whiter than my fucking, like when I wear a white T-shirt. And he tells us, sit the fuck down. We sit down. And I, he didn't shoot. So I start talking. I said, Frank, what the fuck are you doing? Put that away, bro. What the fuck are you doing? We got lawyers working on this shit. It's a, it's a struggle. We go through some shit. What are you getting so hot about? It's yours. You can take it. But uh, what are you doing? Now you're acting stupid now. Again, he's not t shooting, he's talking, he's still got the, the machine gun in his hand. And he's still talking, but he's calming down. So finally, I said, listen, we'll go to the, uh, tomorrow with the lawyers. And whatever you want, we'll straighten it out. It's, it's a lawyer bullshit, bro, it's not us. And then you're breaking the walls. What are you going to do? Go from the, the office up the back thing to the into the disco. That's sneaky shit. That's that's cool. I should have thought of that. And I'm trying to throw him off. And I do. And we're leaving. Even as I'm walking out, I got my back. I'm I'm stiff as a board. I'm 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 thinking I'm gonna get hit. This fucking guy's gonna shoot me, I guess. And we get out. I told my brother, as soon as we get on the sidewalk, call my people. Tell them to meet me at the bar. Say, so, I mean, what are you going to do? Call everybody who's with me. Put my crew together and get them to meet me by the fucking bar. I'm going to kill this cocksucker tonight. That's what I'm going to do. And I don't want your advice. I'm not asking you something. I'm am telling you what to do. So go do it. And I do kill him that night. Right. You put together a crew with uh, Garofalo, Melito. Uh, D'Angelo, uh, Nicholas Marmando, and Michael DeBat. And, um, and Hawk. Okay. Uh, as he's walking out, um, 
Someone said, hey, Frank, how you doing? He turns around, sees you, and then Melito comes up behind him and shoots him in the head. Melito and Stammy are in an alleyway. Me and Eddie are leaning against the car. Michael DeBat is the bounce, he's, he's an ex-football player, he's holding the door. When he when it's going to happen, he'll close the door and tell everybody, get around, get, get upstairs. We have the whole place. I got people on the corners, crash cars, I got people sitting there who's going to take the guns right after the hit. So the cue is that when he comes, he's with three, four guys all the time. I'm going to say, Frankie, what's up? As soon as I say that, He's, come out, let's go, that's on, do it, do it. If these guys move in any way, shape, or fucking form, go for a gun or do anything, shoot them too. Take them all down. That's what we're going to do. The other guys who were with him, they hightailed it. They didn't know which fucking way to scramble to run, and we hit him. We didn't have to hit these other guys. There was no reason for it. So we hit him. Got rid of the guns. Cops came put yellow tape around the whole joint. Me and my brother got, got caught in the yellow tape. They were that ass fast. Well, I mean, from what I understand, after Melito uh, shot him in the head, he stood over the body and fired a shot in each of Fiala's eyes. Yes. And then you walked up to the corpse and urinated in his mouth. No, that's not true. That's not true. No. Okay, that's just a rumor. Yeah, that's not okay. true. That sounded crazy when I heard it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's not true. But what about the matter one? of fact, the cops came so fast. As soon as Louis and, and then they got rid of the guns, they got in cars, everybody was gone. Me and Eddie were just about to walk away. I know that to Michael the Bat, he could open the door, let people run or go away or do whatever. And the cops came and they just spun yellow tape right around us. They must have been a block away when this thing happened. It was there that fast. I couldn't get away. I was standing there, me and my brother-in-law. But, but the shooting in each of the eyes, that was true? That was true. That was true. Is there a reason for that? I don't know. Till today, he hit him one in the head, then he hit him in in both eyes. I really don't know why he did that. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't even ask him when it came out in the paper. I, I don't know why he did that. Well, uh, allegedly, you were never charged for that crime because you paid off the the lead homicide detective five thousand dollars for in in, in a NYPD. Well, we paid people off. To, to mind their fucking business and do certain things. But there was a, an asshole in the neighborhood, this guy, Stevie, something or other. And my guys came to me, Sammy, we're going to talk to you. What? That kid, Stevie, Big Stevie? Yeah. He's bringing, he did it. Good. Let him bring. Keep, keep your mouth shut. Let him run around and take the heat. Bring that you did it. When the fucking feds come, I don't know what the hell he's going to say, but... Let him take the heat. That's The heat is off of us. And it didn't look like it was us because we owned the joint. I owned the building. My office was there. Everything was there. But they they, they knew it was us. They closed the, the disco down. Mm. They closed my office down. They closed everything down. Right. Well, because this was an unsanctioned killing, essentially. So Castellano had a problem with it. Well... It's the way you look at it. Yeah, Castellano had a problem with it. He took it as an unsanctioned issue. I didn't ask his permission first. And we didn't, he didn't talk to me for 19 days. And then I went to a meeting with uh, uh, Louis Melito. He was with uh, Tommy Bellotti, and uh, he talked to me about it. And uh, I said, Paul, I knew you would give me permission. I didn't want to go from what he did to me in that building to your house, back to that club that same night and kill him. You're, they're watching you. They're watching me. They, if they see that movement, now they're going to think I went to you. I try to protect you. Tommy Bellotti looked and looked at Paul and Paul looked at him and he kind of shrugged his shoulders like, that's a good answer, bro. Hmm. So Paul said, I'm going to forget it, but you can never ever do another unsanctioned it without answering. I don't care what the thing is. You could have gotten killed for doing that that hit? An unsanctioned hit? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay. But let me go further a little bit. Good. Because Louis Molina was sitting next to me and, 
And he said, you will never do this again. And I said, I can't say that, Paul. Because if it means for me to protect you in some kind of a way like that, I will do it again. And then you might as well kill me. And Tommy looked at him, and now this time he was like, that's the right answer, Paul. You want to punish him, punish him, but that's the fucking right answer. And I didn't get punished. I, and the thing was over now. God. So that's it. Okay. So that happens. And you start to focus on the construction business more. Yeah, I'm always focused on it. You're always focused it. on it. Um, and essentially, you, you were controlling almost all the concrete in Manhattan. I mean, Donald Trump actually had to work with you in order to get some of his buildings built, right? Sooner or later, everybody who's... You know what is our... The team's the team in 282. On the buildings, you know, the fence that goes all the way around, and then the trucks line up and they go in there in the morning and bring their stuff. I controlled that union 282. And I had teams to foremans in all these places. If I wanted to slow a job down or stop it, I would grab my teams to foreman because they go in there late, 9 o'clock or whatever, open everything up, have coffee, hang out, bullshit people, leave the thing open. Lunchtime, they eat their lunch, they go home and get paid, leave it open. They don't, they don't break balls. But if I tell the guy, do your job, be in there 6 in the morning, stay until 6 at night, I want every truck you check, if the union dues are up to date, check the brake lights, check the tire, the pressure on the tire. I want every truck to sit in there for a half hour. By the time you do your job, job and, he's done, and you're done. Don't do it in a bully way. Do it legitimate. So no matter who the contractor was, would have to call up and say to the president, Bob, Bobby Sasso, you're killing me. Bobby Sasso could say, listen, what do you want me to do? The guy's a team's the form. He's doing his job. So if there's bugs or there's anything, and somewhere in the conversation, he'll say, listen, you know who I saw? I saw the little guy. I heard he was bidding a drywall job. Did he get it? Oh, no, no. Listen, listen. Tell him, I got a job coming up. Let him, let him give me a holler. It's as simple as that. Okay, so by 83, the FBI really started to look at the Gambino family. And then in August of that year, uh, three guys from John Gotti's crew, uh, Angelo Ruggiero, uh, John Carneglia, and Gene Gotti, were indicted for heroin trafficking. And uh, Castellano, the boss, didn't want any drugs, any drug dealing in that family. And that started to cause some problems. Yeah. Uh, I guess Castellano was planning to kill uh, Gene Gotti and Ruggiero for drug trafficking. No, I don't think so. No? No. Uh, okay. Um, but I guess at that point, Castellano found out that there was some surveillance tapes of of these guys talking about, you know, the Gambino crime family. And that became a big issue. The tapes in Angelo's house became a tremendous issue. It wasn't surveillance, it was audio. What he talked about was not only drugs, he talked about all the bosses in the commission, all the underbosses, Paul Castellano himself. These tapes that came out of Angelo's house and John's mouth, in some of these cases, and that whole crew, affected every boss, underboss, and consigliere in the mafia. So they, these tapes that they were went to judges and judges listened to them and gave the government authority to debug his house, his house, his house, his club, his car. Everybody was getting slaughtered with these tapes. And when Paul found out about the tapes, everybody was getting cases. He asked Angelo and... John, he wanted those tapes. He wanted to hear them. Right. He wanted those tapes, but 
that would, you know, had he really listened to them, they would have killed uh, Ruggiero as well as John Gotti's brother, right? Allegedly. I think they were going to kill, I to be honest with you, I think he was going to kill John, his brothers, and that whole crew. He was going to wipe that whole fucking crew out. Right. And then uh, Castellano got indicted uh, for his connection uh, to Roy DeMeo's stolen car ring and as right. being part of the, the commission. Then he found out his whole his own house was bugged. Right. Uh, based on the evidence from the from Ruggiero the, tapes. Yeah, right. So now it's becoming like a clusterfuck. Right. He's caught in the middle of all of that. And he's getting pressure from all the other bosses, the commission, everybody. That everybody's getting busted. That commission case, all the bosses, under bosses, because he is, they're all on those cases, on that case. And a lot of them tapes and a lot of those things created that. From that situation, is that when Gotti got the idea to kill uh, Paul Castellano? To protect his brother and also uh, Ruggiero? I don't think at that point he really gave a shit about Ruggiero, but uh, be honest with you, but I think at that point they knew they were talking with Neil already. They knew they were in big trouble. So it was run, leave the, the country, leave the state, leave some run, or kill or be killed. The only problem, they hit another brick wall with uh, Neil. He wouldn't approve a hit on Paul. He was straight up going, no, so you don't kill a boss. Mm-hmm. He, he had told them in a meeting, there's a lot of government tapes here now again because Neil's house was bugged, got bugged. Wow. So at one point, Ruggiero actually approached you and said that him and John Gotti were planning on killing Castellano and asked for your support. Yes. When they approached you and said that we're going to kill a boss without authorization from the commission, how did you react to it? Well, I knew, but it wasn't they. Angelo, uh, I had an appointment with Angelo by himself. When I went to him, I knew their problem already, but uh, when he said, uh, Sam, I need your help. And I said, to do what? We're going to kill Paul. You're going to kill Paul Castellano, the boss of bosses. Yeah, and we need your help. You and John Gotti? Yeah, of course. Then where the fuck is he, bro? Why ain't he here talking to me like you are? He's your boss. He said he's doing something. Oh, this is not all, this is not a big deal. What's he doing? Shooting dice? While you're asking me to kill the boss of bosses? You're asking me this like a, like a, you want to do me a favor and pick me up a quart of milk on the way home for me? This is the boss of bosses you're talking to me about. And John ain't here. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, Edge. I'm not going to tell you yes. I'm not going to tell you no. I'm not going to tell anybody we had this conversation. But I'm going straight to Frankie Chico's house. I will discuss it with him. And you could tell John, if he thinks he's in trouble and he needs help, he don't need a spokesman. He better come and talk himself. And I left. Well, you left, but the talk continued. And I guess they they couldn't really approach the commission because if they really talked to the other bosses, word would get out and then all hell would break loose. So I guess they try to approach people sort of indirectly with the boss and try to get, I guess they got like three out of the five families well, that people in those later. families to somewhat agree to it, but not really. That came later. That came the next later. meetings he had is with me and Frankie DeChico. Mm-hmm. He had to get us on board. If we weren't on board, he was done. And he knew it. There's no way he could have done this. But he did, he did get me and Frankie on board. He also got Joe Piney on board who was one of the guys who was in the Pizza Connection case, heavyweight, old-timer. We had Joe Piney on board. 
Um, we had uh, Joe Gallo on board, who was the Gozlier, in a in a sneaky way, but he was on on our side in a sneaky way. He was the be- real betrayer of Paul. Mm-hmm. Couldn't get Neil on it uh, to, to agree with this. Right, but then Neil died, and that's when he's now asking other bosses. Right, I guess Gotti was was upset that Castellano didn't attend uh, Neil. Uh, we all were. De, De-, De- Cross's, uh funeral. We all were. Yeah. This is your underboss. When he was there, when he was asked why he didn't go, he said, you know, there's a lot of cops. I got him on trial. He had no idea the only thing that was holding him up from being killed was Neil. Because mm-hmm. Neil wouldn't agree. And we had no intentions of killing Neil. First of all, he was right. So we had no intentions of killing him. So that's what actually kept him alive. Mm-hmm. So it, it's ironic that he dies <laughs> and you don't even go there. This is the guy who kept you alive. Right. And then on December 16th, 1985, you guys put together a crew of 11 people to yeah. do this hit. Uh, Castellano invited uh, to Chicho, De Chicho, De Chico, De Chico. De Chico. Uh, to a meeting. Uh, at Spark Steakhouse. Yeah. What happens next? He invited a bunch of guys. You can't just say to Chico. He's going to have a meeting. He's going to have a meeting with uh, Jimmy Brown, Danny Marino, Johnny Gamarano, uh, him and Tommy Bellotti, Frankie De Chico, uh, Tommy uh, Tommy Gambino. So he's inviting the, some heavies in the family. God knows what he's going to say because he never said it. But he's not just the Chico, because that makes him look like the betrayer, which he was never Mm -hmm. the betrayer. We just knew about the meeting. And being Frankie was going to be in there, we decided, I decided, stay in there with a gun. Soon as the shooting starts, if they get up, just growl at them, Frankie. Frankie was a super tough guy. Sit the fuck down. They're going to know when you tell them, sit down. So he's not a, he was never a betrayer of Castellano because he was closer to Castellano. I was closer to him too, then then I'm a betrayer too. So anyway, but that's how the war broke, broke down and that's how it came down. So go ahead. Well, he ended up getting gunned down and you were across the street when it happened? Yeah. Well, I was on the corner, across the street, on the corner, in a car. I was the guy on the walkie-talkie. I planned the hit. I controlled the hit. I had a 357 Magnum. I was a backup shooter as well. And John Gotti was my driver. Right. So now the boss is dead. Yes. And the new regime starts. Yes. Uh, I guess the only person left from the original crew uh, was Gallo. Yeah, as far as the administration. Yeah. Yeah. But at that point, John Gotti was essentially the boss of that crew. Yeah. Um, and then in January 15th, 1986, he was, a, you know, John Gotti was officially made the boss of that family. What and, date? Uh, January 15th, 1986. All right. Sounds about right. And then uh, De Chico was made the underboss. Yeah. And you got actually elevated <laughs> to capo. Yes. So now you're the capo of a major crime family. What changed at that point? I mean, everything changed. Everybody's life changed. The newspapers were down our backs. The FBI was down our backs. State organized crime force was down our backs. Other families were talking to us, negotiating. Everybody and their mother all over the planet was talking about this hit for not just when it happened, for days and weeks and months. It it never went away. When you guys assassinated Paul Castellano, it was an off-the-record hit on a bus. Was there a big pushback from the commission over this happening? Not really. We won the commission seat without restrictions, but they were making sneak hits. 
Frank DiCicco was killed four months later, blown up in a car. Right. I, was, I want to talk about that for a second. Yeah. So Frank DiCicco was blown up after a car bomb was was put in his car, essentially. Put under the car. Under the car. And this was kind of a no-no because the mafia had banned bombs. Yes. Um, I guess- When you become made, they tell you, you can never use a bomb. Right. I, I guess, and I, I forgot who I interviewed about this, but bombs were being used by the Black Hand originally. The, the guys, yeah, from, you know, it was like Italy. Bomb Alley. I remember at one point there were so many bombs going off like yeah, early it, on. It that, was used in Italy. Yeah. And uh, in, in this country, the only time I've ever heard or seen it really even used was with uh, Al Capone. Yeah. He threw bombs and machine guns. He, he was, he thinks he was fighting World War Three or something. Right. Okay. So did Chico gets killed, yeah. so there's no underboss. So Gotti made uh, Angelo Ruggiero and you co-underbosses. No. No? No. Explain what happened then. John and I sat down and right then, though everybody in the family was shit, the old timers, everybody was, what the fuck is going on? Paul Castellano, Tommy Bellotti, boom, Frankie DeChico, War is on. What the fuck? We have to calm it down. I took over the role of the good Zia of the family. So Joe Gallo, we took him down. He just went to prison. We didn't go yet. I'm sorry. But Joe Gallo, we were taking him down. I was going from captain to good Zia. Mm -hmm. We talked and we said, let's get Joe Piney. He's an old timer. Everybody likes him. Everybody's comfortable with him. Everybody's at ease with him. I think this will ease everything down, John told me. I said, it's a great move. We'll run the family. But as a figurehead, let's put Joe Piney in. That's exactly what we did. After Frankie died, Joe Piney became the official underboss and I moved immediately, almost the same time, to acting concierge. And I was looking for a spot to fill my spot. Big Louie was going to fill my spot as a captain. But that was in movement still. So that's the way it helped. Angelo never made the position of anything. Um... Angelo had fucked up. Everybody was fuming with him. I literally stopped John from killing Angelo twice. Angelo had cancer towards the end. John wanted to kill him. And I said, bro, he's a childhood friend. Everybody knows that. We're going to look like animals here, bro. You are. Let him die of cancer. Leave it alone. Put him on a shelf. Leave it alone. Let him die of cancer. And he did. When he died of cancer, I went to the funeral with John, and he didn't even want to go to the funeral. And I said, bro, everybody thinks that you and him are like this. Everybody's going to be there. Guys in other families, underbosses, bosses, captains, and you're not going to show. And if you're not going to show, I'm not going. So it's going to look horrible for us, bro. He's dead. It's over. Let's go to the fucking funeral and end this. So he had him on to pay me no mind list. If it wasn't for me, he would have killed Angelo. And I'm not trying to take credit. I don't give a fuck uh, about Angelo one way or another. So if it wasn't for me, he would have killed him. And if it wasn't for me, he wouldn't have went to the wake. Okay, so the next person that ended up getting a hit put on him was Nicholas Nicky Cowboy Marmando. And I guess Marmando had gotten addicted to crack cocaine? Yes. And I guess he accused you of, of getting one of his friends addicted also? No. No. He he got Michael the Bat hooked on it as well. Right. When he came into my crew, he made a promise because he was with other people. I didn't want him at first. That he would never, he'd stop doing drugs and he didn't. He started doing crack. He did it with Nicky. Uh, Michael the Bat, 
and, and they both became crack addicts behind my back. And uh, Michael really fell deep into it and had to kill him. Right. I guess you felt that he knew too much and you couldn't take a chance because he was not really... How could I, how could I face you guys or am I crow? And I know that he's a crackhead and I know that he gets arrested. They dangle a little bit of crack in front of his face and he's ratting and when we're in the cell, what do I tell you? Nah, I didn't think it would happen. But he knew all our secrets, Sam, and he's right on the bottom of the barrel with the crack. We can't have that. But you didn't do nothing and that's why we're sitting here. So that's the situation I'm in and I didn't make that happen. He had to kill him. And I loved the kid. I did. I, I did, thought the world of him. I had, he had to go. And then Nikki had to go because he's the one who did it to Michael and brought that shit into my crew. So I got rid of both of them. Right. And, you know, with the with the Nikki Cowboy situation, I guess it was done by Joseph Peruta. Yeah. Uh, Peruta got in the backseat of the car and shot uh, Nikki Cowboy twice in the back of the head corpse was thrown in a vacant lot and they found it the next day yeah okay and then by 1986 Gotti gets arrested and charged with Rico yeah Rico is one of the scariest charges to have because hard case to beat yeah 98% conviction rate with the feds you don't have to be doing anything you just have to be affiliated with someone and the next thing you know you're in a Rico facing 20-30 years um now, by that time, when Gotti, you know, went to jail awaiting the charges, you were essentially running the crew for him while you were on the outside? Yes. Okay. It's not the crew, it's the family. The family. Um, and then at that point, Gotti ordered the, the murder of uh, Robert uh, DiBernardo? Yes. Because he had made uh, negative remarks about him? That was all bullshit. But yeah, but that's all bullshit. I, I mean, is that really all it takes? I mean, to get a murder, just a couple of well, bad Well, it statements? seemed like when, when we were making him from a maid guy to a captain, well, Frankie was alive, John was reluctant and didn't want to do it. There must have been some hidden shit way back, number one. Number two, he really wasn't talking about him. He had an argument with Angelo, and, he, and when Frankie died, Angelo said, I grew up with John. I'm going to be the underboss. DB told him, no, James. You got a lot of balls, but you're fucking dumb. And he got really mad at that in a club. Other people heard it. And there was an argument. And he said, who's going to be the underboss? You? He said, no, not me. Then who? He said, my opinion? Yeah, your opinion. I think Sandy, Sammy should be the underboss. That was the whole argument. So he wasn't talking behind John's back while he was in, but that's the argument they were saying. He was talking behind his back. He wasn't talking behind his back. He was just, Angelo opened up his fucking mouth that he was going to be the underboss, and DB checked him and right. gave his opinion. And then, you know, Gotti's trial ended up in a mistrial with a hung jury. John Gotti walks out of his first of three beaten trials. Yeah. Um, but the only thing is he don't beat the trials. Right. We rigged the trials. We bribed people. The, the first we, trial, was that rigged as well? well? Every fucking trial he had. How was, was that fucking, first trial rigged? Which one? The one with the, the, the woman? Well, the one, the one in uh, 86. That's the, the one the with uh, Willie Boy Johnson was a, a, a rat. Is that that case? I, th I think that was the third one. I think. Well, I'll, I'll get to that in yeah, a second. Yeah, yeah. Tell me what I'll, case it is. I'll, I'll get it. Well, okay. What is that? Well, is that? Regardless, he ended up beating he had, he ended up beating the first trial. Now he's back out on the street again. Is this the one where he beat up a guy? Uh, I'm not sure. It was a Rico case. Well, you know, they yeah. make a Rico case with anything, but... Okay. 81? So... So then by 87, you were actually put under FBI surveillance. 
No, I've been on the I've been on the A S F E I S. Okay, so so that, that had been going on forever. They opened up an office in Staten Island, what they call the twins, Frank and Matty, two agents, and I was that lead target. They opened an office for them so they could be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I didn't just start in 87. I had heat on me for years and years and years from when I was starting to deal with, uh, after I got made, I had heat. Right. And I guess around this time, you started to sense there was a little bit of jealousy over some of your businesses, the legitimate businesses, even though you're kicking up about $2 million a year to Gotti? I, I think it was a little bit less than two, but two is a good number. I mean, I, I think it was a million and a half or whatever. It's close enough. A lot of money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of money. Yeah. Well, he was saying things with uh, the people that came back to me that I sensed that there was either he was starting to become a little bit afraid of me, a little bit of jealousy, envy. And it was by... What people said, I'll give you an example. A guy went in there from the Genovese family and he said to John, boy, you really know how to pick him. And John says, what are you talking about? Sammy, you can't do a fucking job in the city unless you get a wink and a nod from him. And John was completely thrown back and annoyed with that hmm. because he's got this ego. Instead of saying, yeah, that's my man. I'm making money from this guy. No, fuck the money. I'm, this is my man. You want something done? I'll get it done for you. Yeah. Well, wouldn't you want your man to be a fucking king out there who can control the city or could control whatever industry you're in? That makes you a powerhouse. You're an absolute power. You're the boss. Right. This guy has got connections all over the place, in, regardless of how much he's, that's just icing on the cake, how much money he's bringing in. He's a powerhouse. And if you're controlling him, then what are you? But he looked at it backwards. Yeah. Well, and I guess you had said that he was making up to about $20 million a year during his heyday. Probably. I wouldn't doubt it. Right. And you were really like his man. Like you described yourself as his pit bull and his friend, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. You would hold the umbrella for him when, when you guys were outside in the rain, open the Listen, doors for I, him. I, of course. That's respect. Yeah. I tell my guys a couple of times this thing come out with an umbrella. I said- you were my guys. We did things together. You think I'm a punk? No, Sammy, come on. Well, then I hold an umbrella and I open the door. I'm not afraid of him. Why am I doing that? It's respect. If I can't show him respect, then who the fuck am I? And when you guys see that, me holding a thing, then don't have a fucking problem of holding an umbrella or a door for him or your mother, or your father. That's respect. It's not fear. Yeah. You, nobody's going to be free, afraid, so you're going to hold the guys, you know, by, I heard it, some of these some morons say shit like that, but that's, they don't have an idea what the word respect or loyalty or anything does. Now, I, would I hold the umbrella for John? Not over my head, his head, and would I get wet? Yes. Right. Does that make me a dog? If that's what you think, then you're a moron. Well, then at one point, with John Gotti's permission, you actually set up the murders for Tommy Sparrow and some other Gambino associates. I didn't ask for, for permission. Uh, Jimmy Brown and Louis Fats came to John and asked for permission to kill Tommy Sparrow, Spinalio Sparrow. It's their cousin. He was a May guy. John, he was going to go to a... Uh, Grand jury meeting and tell the truth. John called me over and said, Sammy, listen to this. And I listened to it. He says, listen, take this guy out before he goes to that grand jury meeting. I said, all right. I said, John, let me talk to you a bit. Said, Jimmy, uh, Louie, excuse us one minute. Then moved away. I said, John, why am I on this hit? He's a captain. He's a made guy. The cousin's a May guy. He's in their crew. Let's let them do it. What the fuck am I doing? I'm the fucking underboss of the family. Why am I on this hit? Sammy, they'll never get it done. So I didn't ask for this fucking hit. He's giving me these hits. Mm. 
I'm the underboy. I ain't supposed to be on hits no more, unless it's something personal for me and I want to be on the hit. I'm not. I don't. I'm not supposed to be on these things. Right. That's for an associate, a May guy, maybe even a captain, but not even them anymore. Especially on the administration level, you'll never see Paul Castellano or Neil or any of these guys on on the street in a murder. Yeah. He's got me on the street, and I didn't ask him his permission for those things. I didn't want to even be there, nowhere near him. He's putting you on those things. He's putting me on those right. things. Right. And around this time, like, Gotti is really enjoying being in the media. He's loving he, it. He's wearing, you know, $2,000 suits. He's on the front page. He's seeing people look at him. He's like, oh, those are my fans. And this is bothering you because you're like, we're a secret society. We're not supposed to have fans. <laughs> right. Absolutely. A lot of people are being bothered by this. A lot of the mafia guys are being bothered. So many people. And today's facts that came out, every fucking boss, everybody is caught on tapes. The things they said behind his back then, around now, everybody hated it. I could say that everybody hated it. Yeah. And they hated him for what he was doing. Okay. So then John Gotti gets another racketeering trial. And during this trial, there's a guy named George Pape. Uh, that actually approached you to sell his vote on the jury? He didn't approach me. He approached this guy, Bosco. Okay. Who was the head of, he was the boss of the West Westies. They were, had a very close relationship. Um, and he approached him. And uh, Bosco came to me. Then I met with him and made a deal with him for 60000 to buy his vote, twenty thousand right away immediately. Twenty thousand in the middle of the trial, twenty thousand at the end of the trial, and then I would get him a job in the Teamsters room and uh, Teamster foreman, anywhere between sixty-five and seventy-five thousand a year. Right, and he did what he was told. Yes, and John Gotti beat the case. Right, and at that point, the media called him the Teflon Don. Yes, because he had beat trial three times. He was mm-hmm. actually on the cover of the newspaper. The Teflon Don. Right. Was everyone really rolling their eyes when, when they saw that? Well. Because that was, what he that, was that is doing, not something you want out there. What he's doing was destroying the mob. And all the old timers, the seri- you know, young kids, they want to imitate him. But all the old timers and the serious speed dudes in his were sick over this. Yeah. He was doing more damage than 15 people cooperating at the same time. So in 1989, uh, a guy named Yusuf Hawkins, a 16-year-old teenager from East New York, um, went to Bensonhurst. Uh, when he was there, him and his younger brother and two friends were attacked by 10 or 30 uh, Italian youths, uh, with about seven of them having baseball bats. One of them, who had a handgun, and this is the fama, you know, this is a... Um, this is Joseph Fama, had a handgun and ends up shooting him in the chest twice and killing him. Um, and I guess you had convinced his brother for him to actually turn himself in for the murder. I don't remember this too well, but you want to know something? I don't know why the hell I would do that anyway. The more I think about it, why would I tell him to go confess? Well, I give a fuck what he did. I'm not going to tell anybody to go confess and go to prison for the rest of your life. Or I would never tell anybody that. So I don't I don't know if that's what I did. I, I don't know. It sounds confusing <laughs> yeah, to me. Your name was thrown in. They had a documentary about him recently, and it, it said that you were the person that can, you know was involved in convincing the shooter to actually turn himself into police because at that point it turned to a huge thing in New York. There was protest, uh, you know, Al Sharpton was involved and there was a speaking out and it created all these racial problems and so forth. Yeah. I, I do, I do remember now when you're talking about Al Sharpton. Yeah. yeah he was going to come down and he was going to protest in our neighborhood. Walk in down 20 in Bensonhurst. Yeah. Walk down 20th Avenue now. I'm starting to think. And Gas Pipe came to me, the underboss of the Lucchese family. And he said, this Al Sharpton's going to come down. You want to kill him? I said, 
Now, what do you mean, kill him? In the middle of the street? Because he's protesting? Yeah. No, no, get the fuck out of here. No, that's, you know, that's insane. Because if that's what you do, then there'll be four million of people protesting the next day. What are you, crazy or what? You can't do something like that. Just let him walk through. Let him protest and walk through. And do his protest and whatever. I wasn't even sure what happened with the thing. So with this, I guess it's the, now this is related to the Hawkins kid. Yeah. So the people are saying that I told this kid to go confess or go turn himself in. To, to, so I'm trying to make peace in the neighborhood. I fuck, I wouldn't do that. Okay. I fucked the neighborhood and I wouldn't do it. Okay. If the neighborhood explodes, it explodes. And if I did that, I must have been drunk. Okay. Well, 1990, <laughs> December 11th, uh, the Ravenite Social Club gets raided. Yeah. You get arrested along with Gotti and Lacasio? Lacasio. Lacasio. You end up pleading guilty to a superseding racketeering charge. Uh, Gotti gets charged with five murders. Castellano, Bellotti, uh, De Bernardo, Melito, and De Bono, along with conspiracy uh, to murder uh, Vistola, along with loan sharking, illegal gambling, obstruction of justice, bribery, tax evasion. According to all the FBI tapes, everyone was denied bail. Um... And I guess the attorneys were disqualified from actually working with you and Gotti because they were saying the attorneys were part of the evidence. Yeah. So, and then these tapes started to come out when you hear John Gotti bad-mouthing you. When you first heard those tapes, what'd you think? I knew he was betraying me behind my back. I know exactly what I mean, half the shit he's talking about didn't make sense and wasn't true. Then I find out later on after that that there's a plot. He was looking to take me out towards the end. So now all those lies and all that bullshit is making sense. So what is he going to use? You can't kill your underboss. You can't kill a major guy in the family who's bringing in a ton of money, doing work, doing everything he's supposed to do, and you kill him. If you do that as a boss, it backfires. Because everybody looks at you and says, oh my God, if he could kill him, he can kill any of us. And and the, the thing reverses on you. Everybody becomes a little skeptical of you, a little afraid of you, a little, it's not a good thing. So he's making up all these stories about what I did, and now I find out the other parts of it. Now I find out parts of it where he was going to send me on the lamb. And before he was going to send me on the lamb, he gave me an order to kill Chen, a boss of another family. But his plot was really, really great. He told me to kill Chen. He says he's behind this Frankie the Chico thing. I loved Frankie. You're talking about uh, Chen Gigante. Chen Gigante, yeah. yeah. So if I were to kill Chen... But on his orders. Now I come back in. How'd you make out? I got him last night. He would have killed me immediately. Now he has the answer. He was doing all these things, killing people, taking over things. He lost control of him. I loved him like a brother, but he lost his mind. And then he came to me. He killed Chin. I had to kill him. So it's understandable to everybody now. So, Number one. Number okay. two, he goes to the Genovese people and he tells them, he came in and told me that he whacked him, he wanted to take over, and I, I had to take him out. Aha. Uh -huh. So the plan was to essentially blame all the murders on you and then kill you, and then he walks away free. That's what he was going to do with the, with the case. Now, like I said, you don't, you don't have to call him a rat, but that's a rat move. When you're on trial, you're both fighting for the same thing. Now, if you're going to back up the government's tapes, your, your tapes that the government has, and you're going to back up all these things and you're going to tell me right to my fucking face, you're going to be found guilty and that sets me free. Well, it's not a rat move. It's a rat move. It's not a rat, but it's a rat move. Who the fuck does that? 
Well, was it because of that that you ultimately decided to cooperate? Yeah. And this was in 1991? Yes. Okay. We got pinched in, what, November, no, uh, December of 90. Mm-hmm. I cooperated in November of 91. Right. O- almost a full year later. Yeah, November 13th, 1991. Right. You agreed to testify. Right. They gave you a plea deal for your cooperation. Yeah. Was it uh, 20 years? 20 year cap. Okay. That doesn't sound like that great of a plea deal on the surface. 20 years? I know it's a cap, but still, it's up to the judge's discretion at the end of the day, right? Yeah. Why would you take a 20 year plea deal? Because I'm facing, I'm, you didn't read my charges. I'm faced with uh, three, four murders, conspiracy to murders, and, and a whole bunch of other shit too. Okay. So I'm facing life without parole. I'll never see the street. Got it. So I go in when I'm, you got to count the, when I went in, I was like, let's say 40 uh, in 90, or almost 41. So 20 years, I can get out, 60, 61. There's, even with a 20-year sentence, there's good time. So I'm going to do like 17. Right. So it's not the end of the world yet. It's not. It's still a lot of time, but. Okay. And then the next year, 1992, uh, Gotti's trial starts. The jury selection starts. And um, it's actually an anonymous jury because they're so worried about jury tampering because it's happened so many times before. This is, I guess, you've never seen this in a Brooklyn federal case before. Like they're really kind of almost changing the rules in a way because of what happened before. Um, you know, the prosecutors begin playing the tapes, you know, where Gotti's discussing Gambino business, all the murders he approved, um, you know, talking about how he hated Castellano, you know, so the motive to actually kill him. Um, And then you actually get brought to trial on March 2nd. Here you are where most of your life you're told, you know, you should not cooperate. You take a a blood oath and, you know, cooperators are getting killed for this type of thing. How hard was it to really say, okay, I'm actually going to cooperate and take the stand? How hard was it? It was something I was against every principle in my life. Yeah. Something I never even thought of doing. I've been arrested all my fucking life. And I faced cases that I've been offered that a hundred times. Every time I was pinched. And I never did it. But I, I'll be goddamned if I'm going to turn around. If Cosa Nostra is that we kill each other, we do this, we do that. And then when we get pinched, you're going to throw me to the wolves. You want me to do the time so you can hit the street. Now I ain't doing it. I quit. The mafia, I quit him, and I didn't give a fuck what happened to me. I would deal with whatever had to happen. Well, when you took the stand, you confessed to 19 murders, and you implicated uh, John Gotti in four of them. Yeah. And I, I'm not sure if that's the true number, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, Gotti's lawyers cross-examined you, uh, called you a junkie, uh, talked about you use steroids and everything else like that, but... After days of, of sitting on the stand, you pretty much maintain your story the whole time. Uh, during the trial, you and Gotti would look at each other sometimes. Yeah. How was that? Well, we're not that far from each other. I mean, when we're talking, sometimes we'll glance and look at each other. Sometimes we'll literally growl at each other. <laughs> sometimes we would like to have a fucking pistol each and shoot each other. I mean... It's not an easy situation. But you know what's weird, I think, about, and I never get to ask this question, is that you sat there, you just sat across from each other, testifying, and people say, I was unflappable. And you couldn't break my story. Mm -hmm. That was in 1991. 2001, 2011, 2021. That's 31, 32 years ago. Mm -hmm. And whatever I said and did, 32 years ago, after 100 different people cooperated and tons of fucking tapes and everything else, (laughs) nobody ever turned it over or never 
disputed anything I've ever said. So right. that's a little weird, maybe too. Another little fact. Yeah. Well, and then on June 23rd, 1992, uh, John Gotti uh, and Lucatio was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Yeah. Plus a $250,000 fine, or whatever that's worth. And then you testified in six more trials? Probably could be. Yeah. I cooperated for two years in good faith. My deal was two years in good faith. After two years, it would be up to me. And I never cooperated after the two years. Only if a trial bounced over the two years because it was postponed or whatever. But I never cooperated again. Right. And based and, on... Uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Well, uh, based on the cooperation, um, Vincent the Chin Gigante got convicted. Yeah. Um, who was the head of the Genovese yeah. uh, crime family. Uh, Colombo family, uh, Lil Vic Orena got convicted. A mm. bunch of other mafia guys. Uh, 11 captains, a crooked cop, and the head of the Teamsters local um, with a total of 38 people ended up getting convicted. Now, when you look at, you know, the people that ended up behind bars, you know, we understand the situation between you and John Gotti. He's on tape and he's saying this, that, and the third about you. And, you know, he was going to turn on you. He was going to kill you. He was going to try to pin the murders on you. The other 38 people, did you have personal beefs with any of them? Or was it just, I got to no. do my job and, and so forth? No, I didn't have no personal beefs on that. But another part of my agreement is that I wouldn't cooperate and I didn't cooperate against any of my family or any of my crew mm -hmm. or a woman who helped me rig a trial. Because my crew came with me on a hit because I ordered them and told them to come with me. So I couldn't, I, I, I never cooperated against them. That's a fact. Yeah. My family or that woman. And a lot of those people could have maybe and should have took a fucking plea who went to trial and did certain things. Uh, the jurors, some of those people didn't even get hurt that you're talking about. And I had no control over that. Um, and they do what they want to do. You know, and it's it sounds like that I put them in jail. It sounds like that. They put themselves in jail. Let, yeah, let's talk it, about it Chen. Let, let's talk yeah. about Chen. I'm not the only guy who testified. Yeah. Al Diaco testified. Other people testified. They had tapes. They had everything under the sun. So I, I was a part of that. But when they say, you put 38 people away, I could have put 338 people away in reality. Mm -hmm. And I didn't. So when I look at myself, what I did, I mean, the guy who set up and rigged the trial, do you know, let's call out his sentence, what he got. This is me in the background telling them, this guy was a mope, bro. <laughs> you know, don't hurt him that bad. He got three years. Three years. He got three years. So look at some of the sentences, but let's look at one thing that's even more important. The government don't like me. Right now, if people think they like, they don't. I got nine, nine cases that I testified for the defense against the government mm -hmm. since that agreement. That's been going on for years. But that's not even talked about. Well, based on your deal and the cooperation that you did for those two years, you guys sentenced to five years in prison. Yes. Way less than the 20 that you were potentially yes, facing. Yes. And since you had already served four years, you basically got less than a year. I think I, I think with good time and everything, when I when I finally got sentenced, I had seven months to go. You know, people were outraged that someone who admitted to killing 19 people got less than five years. When yeah. you hear people say that, how do you feel? I don't give a flying fuck about them, to tell you the truth. I don't, I don't really care what they say or what they do. I live my life. I do my own thing. I could have got 20 years. When people sit down and say, you know, I, I heard Judge Gleason's remarks. 
And he said some of those people would have came out, they would have been doing murders for all these years. So in essence, what he said and did may have saved hundreds of murders. Now, I don't want credit for doing shit like that. I don't believe in it. But you could say whatever you want. What I will say is that, you know, I hear people talk about black people and say something negative or whatever. Or, of course, they live in a certain neighborhood or certain thing. And I say, you gotta, you got to live in a man's shoes. You can't put people down for what you think in your little basement with your little crappy-ass computer. Live in those people's mind and other people's shoes before you open your fucking mouth. And what would you do if you were in my shoes and you were facing murders and getting set up? What the fuck would you do? Mr. Hero, Mr. Guy who turns around and bat mouths other people who don't even know what the fuck planet you're on or what you're talking about with your little bitchy computer in a, in a hole someplace and you want to pass a remark. Some people uh, won't like I'm sitting here with you. Some people don't like I do my own show. I don't give a fuck about them. I don't do it for them. You know, if people can't look at someone and say, the guy is doing the right thing, he changed his life, whether it's me, whether whoever it is, not just me. There's guys out there um, who are doing the same thing and, and, and changing their life. Look at Michael French, he's changed his life. He's changing it in a good way, in a positive way. I've become a little friendly with him now. Right, you guys had an interview together. We did that interview together. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so, uh, and now we're, we're talking together in a good way, but we don't, we don't sit there and knock each other. I don't knock yeah. what he does. He don't knock what I do. It's, you know, but it's always the people who say those things, go back and look at them. Yeah. They're failures. They can't stand somebody who makes a little bit of success. Michael Franzese in uh, one of our interviews actually said that you killed a guy and you went to the funeral and blamed him for killing him. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say who that was or was that part of your deal or no? Well, it's in another story. But I, that's, who it was is unimportant. Okay. I'll tell you, what, you it, actually did what it was. What it is is that we have rules that we live by. So we know if we break the rules, like when I cooperated, I, I broke a rule. Mm -hmm. I don't blame a guy to come and kill me. He was my friend. He's in the life. He's supposed to. Why should he die? I broke the rule. His job now is to kill me. So when I looked at the guy in the coffin, I told him, bro, look what you did. You know you would get killed. And you know more than likely it will be me or Joe Blow who's pulling the trigger. This is what you did. Look at your kids. Look at your family. You did this. We do these things to ourselves. You go to prison. I was in prison for 22 years of my life with hundreds of guys, different races, different everybody, Mexicans, everybody, you name it. We do it to ourselves, bro. What are we, who are we blaming now? Who are we going to blame? It just don't even make sense to me. Well, you get your, your prison time. Yeah. You get out and you get into the, uh, the U.S. Federal Witness Protection Program. Yeah. Uh, originally in uh, uh, Tempe, Arizona. Your name was Jimmy Moran at the time. Yeah. But then you end up leaving after about a, a year or two? Eight months. Eight months. At the point that you're out, are you, you know, are you hearing there's a price on your head or, or anything else like that? The, when I, the first time I got out, before I went back into prison, in Arizona. I knew John would pay somebody or do something to make a move. And they did. Some guys came down to do what they had to do. They had me for four or five months. It didn't work. They were afraid to come near me, but it didn't work. So guys were actually in your area trying to kill you? Yes. Did they ever shoot at you, do anything? No, they didn't get close enough. They were, I had little precautions and they, they knew that it was, it was going to be like a mission impossible. How, how did you know they were there? I didn't know they were there. I just protected myself 
knowing it would happen. Okay. And I put myself in a good position. But how did you find out there was guys there to kill you is what I'm saying. And they got pinched. Oh, okay. One guy got pinched for drugs and he ratted on all the rest of them. And just before I went away, I got pinched in 99 in Arizona and I was gone and that was the end of me. Okay. And the, the, that's all, folks. Remember Pokey Pig? That's it. <laughs> right. Let's go. <laughs> well, um, in, in, in 1997, you actually wrote a book. What? In 1997, you wrote a book called Underboss. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about the whole situation. Uh, the families try to file a lawsuit against you uh, from the profits of the book. Did they ever get those profits? No, they, they, they failed on the son of Sam law. Uh -huh. It didn't work. Right. Later on, I got pinched for other things, and yeah, and everybody got some money. Right. Then in 1999, uh, you get arrested for some drug charges. You get 20 years, and now you're back in prison again. And this time, you're an ADX. And is this when you were in solitary confinement for like six years? Six and a half years. I was in. What did that do to you? Six years of solitary confinement in a supermax. Look at me. It made me better looking. It made me stronger. <laughs> what the fuck? It was fucked up. At six and a half years, I, I'll tell somebody, go do, go in a room, stay in this room, and I'll give you all the conveniences you want for six and a half weeks. Yeah. <laughs> you just get stuck crazy. You don't want to stay in there. Right. So. And then, oddly enough, in, in 2003, there's a new indictment for a 1980 murder, 1980 murder, of NYPD detective uh, Peter Calabro by contract killer Richard Kuklinski, a.k.a. the Iceman. Right. That's a hell of a story, but you have to stay tuned because that's, I'm under contract. That's going to be in one okay. of my stories that I'm tied up like a knot. Fair enough. As good as this man is, I can't give it to him. Fair enough. Unless he gives me another. <laughs> <laughs> and then you finally get out in 2017. Yes after serving almost 20 years? Almost 18 years. I almost served 17 years, seven months, to be exact. And at this point, you're completely done with your life of crime. I'm done. I'm That's done. It. I'm and done. And so forth. I'm 77 years old. I'm done. I'm doing stuff in Hollywood. I'm working on some shorts that I'm doing. Actually, I'm doing a podcast where I talk about stuff and I'm on video. Now I took it to a whole new level. I'm doing shorts. It's a little 12 minute clips, five or six of them. And uh, we made up a story about uh, a serial killer. The FBI comes to me mm -hmm. and go after the serial killer. Now I got two act two hours of acting classes and I'm in the movie and I'm acting my brains out. Love so <laughs> I'm going to do that. So I'm doing great things, nice things, and uh, but I love I love doing these uh, shorts, and uh, they'll be out on SammyTheBull.com. We're gonna give you the link and everything to check it out. There you go. And there I go. Final question: When I spoke to a lot of mob guys over the years, the one guy they really put in the highest regard was Carmine the Snake Persico. He was supposed to be the real Cosa Nostra, hardcore gangster who played by the book, never cooperated and so forth. But then on August 21st of last year, it was actually revealed that he was an informant. I saw that newspaper article. I don't know if it's true or false, but I don't have him, and I was under him for a long time. That's why I ask. So I don't have him in very high regard. You don't. They killed a fucking woman. When you start killing women, I'm not going to say he killed a child because he didn't, but when you start killing women and innocent people and shit like that, my, I think you crossed the line. That's not causing Austria anymore. I don't know what, that's a serial killer. You just lost touch with yourself. We had guys in the Gambino family. I think he was cold-hearted, very vicious, just like when I was a kid, he sent me on a thing. Bring back the guy's ear. His ear, boy, because he was fucking somebody. 
You want me to give him a beat and I'll give him a beat and all two of us or three of us could give him a beat. Why would you want to cut the fucking guy's ear off? You yeah. Know? I mean, would you consider yourself a serial killer? With 19 no, people no, that no. you admitted to killing? Huh? Well, you've admitted to killing 19 people. You don't consider yourself a serial no, killer? No, no, no. No, of course not. Mass uh, murderer? A uh, what? Mass murderer? I don't like the sound of that, but I mean, you can call me that, call me whatever you want. I'm fighting for Gozo Nostra. I never killed a woman, a kid, an innocent person. I kill people in the mafia. Other soldiers. So what do we do? Yeah, other soldiers. Yeah. What, what do we do to soldiers now? Should we sit them down when they come home from these wars and tell the guy, you killed 20 people, 200 people, he's using bombs and everything. Are you a serial killer? Should we ask him questions like that? I don't think they're serial killers. They're fighting for their country. Yeah. Most of them are young, stupid, and they're bullshitted by our government that these guys are the enemies. When I was there, I was going to fight in Vietnam. Well, that's when I was in the military. Go kill them. They're going to come in here. They're going to rape your mother and your sisters. And I was geared, if I would have went to Vietnam, I would have killed them. Now, I've been in jail 22 years. I've never seen a Vietnamese person in prison. So they're either very good crooks or they're not bad people. And the only Vietnamese people I've ever known, and I'm not a kid, I'm 77, is women who do your nails and your toenails, and they're very polite. So the government, I think, was bullshitting me all the while. You know, they'll tell you things about Italians. They'll tell you things about black. They'll tell you things. It's, it's, it's a bunch of bullshit. Yeah. It's a bunch of bullshit. But it, you do, you know, you go across and you live your life. You do your thing, and uh, you, you, you keep your mouth shut, you know, as much as you could and go through with your life. If there's consequences, you take your consequences like me. If they want to shoot me in the head, shoot me, bro. Yeah. I, I got it coming. Go ahead. Well, Sammy the Bull, uh, I think, you know, when I have people like yourself on this show, you know, the, the Italian mafia in particular gets so romanticized by the movies. When you talk about people's favorite movies, they'll say Goodfellas. They'll say Casino. They'll say The Godfather 2. Uh so you have this romantic element of these group of people that are almost inhuman in terms of their principles and, and how they are, and they don't function like everyone else. But as I've seen time and time again, these are all people. And if you go and commit to a life of crime, it usually ends very badly. Uh, it ends yeah. with a lot of prison time yeah. or it ends with death or the people around you getting killed or yeah. going away forever. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I've never met anyone that walked away and just rode off into the sunset with millions of dollars. I've never heard that. Not without a lot of losses along the way. And yeah, interviews like this, true. I think, really prove that. That's true. I mean, I, I believe that, you know, they asked me to talk to kids. I talk to kids. I mean, I said, I, I don't know what to say. I'm going to sound like a fake or a phony. And I don't like bullshit. But I, I would tell kids... You want to be me? You want to be Sammy the Bull? I got 22 years in prisons. I was shot on two different occasions, stabbed once, shot my friends. Be me. Go ahead, motherfucker. Do whatever you want. Be me. To talk with a kid, don't do that. They're not going to listen to you. Say, here, yeah, you want to be me? This is me. I saw a black guy just recently doing a video like that, and uh, he's behind bars, and he's talking to kids. Mm -hmm. Bro, go out there, get your spots, make some money. Look at this cell. This is where you're going to sit with me. And he's right. That'll scare the shit out of people. Yeah. You know, that'll wake kids up. So that's the, you know, that's the sorry part of it. And, uh, you know, it's not who cooperated, who did this, who did that. I mean, this country, we're giving out billions of dollars now to Ukraine. This is a fucking joke. We got homeless people everywhere. We're not giving them a dime. We got ghettos somewhere. We ain't giving them a dime. But we can give Ukraine, because we feel bad for them, 40 million, billion, not million, billion dollars. We don't want to take care of our problems. There's no fucking milk for babies. <laughs> I mean, this country's going fucking, we, we're going in the wrong direction. And they got people, everybody's arguing with everybody for some reason or another. I think it's created. It's not necessary. 
But uh, we'll see what happens. That's how we'll end it. Sammy the Bull, appreciate you sharing your story. Thank you very much. Peace.